welcome to this episode of Trusted Partnerships. Uh, my name is James Murray. I'm the Product Marketing Lead for EMEA, and I'm delighted to have with me Adrian Cutler. Adrian, I know you've been working uh, with iProspect on a really cool white paper, which we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so let me just uh, allow you to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, hi. Uh, great to be here today, James. Thanks very much. So I'm Adrian Cutler. I look after Denser Aegis uh, in Microsoft Advertising. Uh, Director of Global Agency, and we've partnered with iProspect on uh, three different papers now. And this latest one called In Brands We Trust uh, was really because we wanted to understand how does the world understand and perceive our advertising world. Uh, we also wanted to deeply get in, under the skin of uh, what does privacy and trust really mean for the world population? Uh, so this research was done across 16 markets. It's um, a significant volume of 25,000 people to really try to get under the skin of it, uh, which is a fantastic opportunity for us to see, you know, how are we positioned? What do they think about privacy and trust all up? Uh, and also how can a brand connect with them uh, on a, you know, deep uh, a connected level, which actually it was never built for this. But if you think about that, the current climate that we're in, it feels highly relevant for brands to better understand how the consumers can connect with a brand on a on a trusted way. Yeah, because <clears throat> I think we see that there is clearly there's a an, an all time low in sort of consumer trust of advertisers, and we see that in in lots of different instances. Um, and so when we get to this stage, I think one of the uh, impacts of that, and one of the backlashes, is. Uh, consumers taking back control and wanting to avoid giving data. And so the value of third party data is, is going to be diminished. And we're, we're looking at the prospect of, of a cookie-less world. So with that kind of background and with the, the, the idea of trust and, and privacy, like what are some of the implications that we've seen from the, from the research? Yeah, and I mean, fundamentally, it's, it's really about the cookies. Uh, the cookies are the effect, not the cause. So the cause is really, it's about people. Um, the, you know, fundamentally, the way that we as marketers have uh, engaged with people has been to use cookies to know them, to find them, to follow them. And generally, the populace tolerated that. I think tolerated is the key word. Uh, fundamentally, until we compromise their trust. And so from the research, you know, one of the key stats that we found is that 87% of respondents say that they believe data privacy is a right, not a privilege. So again, you know, this really sort of starts to drive home of how a third party cookie-less world that's disappearing and moving to sort of just first party data is really driven not because of technology or because of function, but because people have a demand for privacy. And <clears throat> so does that then mean, so from an advertiser's perspective, with the with the prospect of uh, third party data being diminished, that we should all be rushing out to have a, a first party data strategy and starting to collate first party data for ourselves? Nice one, James. And I love that sort of approach. It's because it's too funny. I liken it back to, you know, as we started to see chatbots come into existence and you know brands would come to us and say I need a chatbot this was like well okay but do you do you know that your the the consumers the people that you want to connect with are going to engage with you in that way how are they engaging with you currently and is it a way that you would want to be engaged with that brand so again you know actually this the sort of move to a first party data strategy has exactly the same ramifications that we saw as the sort of rise of the bot ecosystem. That it's about really understanding what is it that you're trying to do, brand, and how you want to talk to people. Um, you know, let's face it, if people are thinking about their first party data strategy that they need to go and collect email, um, let's be really, really clear on this. Do you know that your consumers want more email? I don't know about you, James, but um, personally, I feel I get I get enough email. I'm I'm all right. But if anybody else doesn't, please reach out to us and make we make sure that we add you to lots of email distribution lists. You know, fundamentally, it's about how do we think about that quality over quantity. And it's okay to have a first party data conversation as long as it's going to be 
you know, valid and what the people want to engage with um, and how we're going to use that as well. You know, I liken it back to as well, you know, the concept that we got into with programmatic advertising, that it's OK to just sort of swap out creative messages. Um, but actually, there was no way we'd ever in a TV example. So take uh, the cause man. You wouldn't just swap out the cause bottle with a Heineken bottle and rerun the TV commercial. So, you know, people have an affinity and make a connection to something. So we just need to be very careful and considerate that if we are going to create a first party data strategy, how are we going to use that data? And are we going to use it to continue a conversation as opposed to just swapping something out, which yeah. is fascinating. <clears throat> and I guess like one of the things that, that comes through from that is if you're going to be gathering that data, ensuring that it's actually valuable to to the to the consumer it's clearly valuable to to us as the marketer but i think you know sometimes we lose the um a little bit of perspective about what that value exchange is and, and i know also that that came through quite strongly in the in the research yeah exactly so when we look at the research actually 91 percent of people said that they had a concern with the amount of data that is being collected on them I already said the stat about 87% believe privacy is a right. And also 72% of people would stop using a brand or service if they felt that their data, the data demand on them, their personal information was too much. And also, if a brand is sort of forcing them down a route of giving information for them to get a service, get a product, 88% uh, of people would give false information. So when we think about, you know, how we as marketers and brands would use that information, chances are the demographics, if it's forced from a brand led perspective or from a way that is not a natural part of the conversation, it's false information anyway. So the over segmentation and hyper personalization, chances are it, it's not accurate um, because they 88 percent provide false information. And then one of the concerns there is that we put so much effort into our segmentation, but you're you're potentially missing out on customers either because you're only targeting a very niche um, subset or the people that you are targeting, if they've give, given false information, are, are not actually interested in, in that thing anyway. Yeah, that's exactly right. And the, um, you know, again, from the research, we found that because, you know, that information would often be used to drive, you know, a personal experience. So actually, we, we asked them that question as well on the research, and only 24% of people value that personal experience. And when it comes to a website experience, 79% of people said that they just want the same website, whether they're using it, family, friends, whoever else are using it, they just want it to be the same. Um, they, they literally don't care about that personalization that we've put so much emphasis on. And even more interesting as well, of, you know, that value exchange, because again, that's another way that we would use that data of how do we offer that value exchange. I was words value exchange surveyed the populace. Um, we put it in a way to, to sort of pull that information out, which is, you know, if you're using a product or service, um, what would give you an interest or an intent to then provide that personal data? Um, and fundamentally from the research, unless a brand is going to give away a product or a service or free shipping or a discount code, they just don't care. <laughs> so something that I was really surprised about as well is uh, one of the stats that was particularly low of where people would provide personal information is, say, for example, you know, you've got a delivery coming of something you've purchased and you're given, a, you know, a time window. But for that time window, you, you would need to provide, you know, contact information, maybe a mobile phone number, or you've got somebody that is maybe coming to repair something in the house. And again, you're given like a time window, but it could be narrowed and say, actually, we're going to be with you in four hours, be with you in the next 30 minutes. Um, so for me, I always do that. I would always provide, you know, my contact information so that I can, I can get that value. Uh, however, on mass, from the survey we did, most people won't. Um, which I found deeply surprising. So even in that situation where it seems like an obvious win, people would still prefer not to provide that information. 
And and I think that's one of the other things that we have to be quite uh, conscious of as as marketers is not to make the the fallacy of saying, well, I'm okay with this, so that must be the way that the general population thinks. And so that's part of the the value of what this shows is that we can't make those assumptions. Yeah, so if we, if we absolutely right. If we if we look at these. What we're seeing and, and you know what the, the research is sort of leading us towards is that does what are the implications, I guess, for, for marketers going forward? Does this mean that we shouldn't be using demographic targeting or things like remarketing um, that, that they they no longer have value as part of the marketer's toolkit? Got it. So uh, I my my point of view is that I don't think it's a I don't think it's it, it's that we will see the end of uh, demographics per se, but um, it's very. We need to be very considerate of to what data we are using and how we're using it and how it's collected, because if it's forced collection of that data, then 88% uh, would give false information. Uh, so if we think about it actually from a place of you know where are are ways that we can understand people's intent or where the data is solid. You know, take LinkedIn, for example, you know, I think that that's a really good representation of a person's business profile. Generally, it seems to be quite accurate because if it's not, people will be found out quite quickly. So if you're aggregating that sort of data and then perhaps also if we think about um, the intent signals that people would give, you know, this is how the industry was founded, with understanding what was people's intent based on the keyword, the message. Uh, so actually, the biggest form of intent is search on the planet so you know i think when you when you combine the understanding of you know sort of platform based demographic with intent then you can end up with something that is still completely useful in a search marketers or a marketers toolkit because then you're really understanding well what is the intent of that person today uh, because look, I, I you know I'm I'm a man. I'm 45. I live in the south of England, and that is my demographic data. But what I'm going to buy today is not what I'm going to buy tomorrow. You know, the current climate. You know, I might be purchasing a bit more kitchen roll and toilet paper, for example. <laughs> um, but I might also be looking to buy some more Play-Doh to keep my three-year-old entertained because she's not able to play with her friends. So you know, again, my my intent changes very drastically in the moment. So yeah. it's it, it's okay, um, but again, we need to we just need to be considerate of what is that intent, what is the context of the situation, and if we are collecting first party data, are we doing it for the right reasons, and is it accurate? That's that's the concept, I believe. Yeah. So if I summarise what we've kind of talked about, we we've seen the <clears throat> move or the or the sort of the beginnings of the shift away from third party data. Um, as the the symptom or not the cause, but the the symptom of consumer sort of uh, increased desire for privacy and and a bit of a backlash against the advertising industry. Uh, and but we've seen that come through with uh, you know advertisers needing to adapt, but not necessarily thinking right. I've got to rush out and um, go and uh, get a whole bunch of emails. <clears throat> we've also seen that. Uh, we talked about the the sort of the value exchange of of um, what marketers perceive to be a good value exchange for data and what consumers perceive. And those things that are, are fundamentally quite different. And so, I think this this is a message to all of us to to re-examine some of the assumptions that we might have and uh, really think about whether we need to go deep on uh, personalization of our web experience or of our of our marketing. Um, and whether actually we could take a step back and give people something a bit more generic. But that's not to say that we completely abandon things like remarketing and demographics as, as levers that we can pull just to be very conscious of doing it at the right moment and the right time. To your point, yeah. uh, Adrian, the, the Microsoft employee is not the same as Adrian, um, you know, Jessica's dad who, who needs to buy Play-Doh. And so I think trying to, to be conscious of that, that we are fundamentally talking to people and not, you know, people are not there, just their demographic outline. Yeah, and the and I think this is a really good opportunity for marketers and for brands. Um, it, you know, if we if if we have this connection with people, let's use it for something really good. So, you know, let's think about the emotional connection that we already have that can be authentic. 
you know, a, a good example of this is um, again with iProspect, but you know, we work with many partners in many ways on on the same sort of approach. Is um, through our Ecosia syndication network, we were able to plant two and a half million trees with iProspect. So you know, this this you know sort of resonates to what their agency culture is of you know how they're trying to have impact in the world. So the stories that they create and the way that they communicate are shaped around that, around their own culture. You know, we do it in Microsoft. We talk a lot about our own culture and, and a lot of the stories and narratives that we tell, tell the world uh, are around that. So I think it actually opens up a good opportunity for brands, agencies to really think about, and us as marketers, how do we uh, is a thing that is going to drive a connection to a person as opposed to just the demographic data that is going to target them? So that, you know, I think it's a good opportunity. And also, um, you know, a good way to think about this as well is we we analyzed all of this data, you know, across the planet, 16 markets, uh, thousands of people. So massive amounts of data to prove that you don't need data. <laughs> it comes back to intent and the connection that you have with the person. Yeah. I think that's a lovely uh, note for us to finish on. So all that remains for me to say is, Adrian, thanks very much for your time. Uh, and we'll see you next time on the next Trusted Partnership interview. Thanks very much, James.